Hey guys, welcome back. I am Joy Todd. I'm Sarah Parker Massey. And I'm Jenny Black. Ooh. Welcome to After the Episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a feeling after my YMCA update last time. <laughs> I wondered. I wondered. I was like, oh, no. (laughs) I jinxed it. (laughs) We've reverted back to the crying and them calling me to come get her. But I'm still So now she's crying and you're not crying anymore. Right. right. One of us is just always crying. I mean, I'm just like, well, they really have no choice other than just to keep bringing her. And so I asked them. I was like, I just need to keep doing this, right? They said, yeah. I was like, okay, I just feel bad. I don't mind doing it. I feel bad. I want you guys to see me walking around the corner and then just be like, oh, Oh, God, they're back. Like, no, we love Penny. And that's that age group. Well, and they're used to it. They know it's just part of the deal. So I was like, well, as long as you guys are okay with it, then we can can power through. I'll power through. So she actually did. Okay, I haven't taken her much this week. She's got a big stuffy nose. But other than that, bedtime with Ava is one of my least, that's like my biggest yeah. part of the day where I'm just at zero and I just want her to be easy and go to bed and not need to snuggle and not need me to tuck her in and not just not need anything. Just go brush your teeth, get in bed. I'll see you tomorrow. And there's a bag of Jolly Ranchers on the table. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to put one of these Jolly Ranchers in my mouth <laughs> and I'm going to go and lay with her. And when this Jolly Until Rancher is done, <laughs> that's long. I can leave. And I meant to look up the average amount of time it takes for a Jolly Rancher to dissolve, but I haven't yet. Joy, that's so but hurt. I was in there long enough, and we ended up having a great time. We were laughing. She was asking about, like, pet stories, and we started doing some Winnie the Pooh quotes because Penny watches it all the time, and we were just making each other laugh. And I was like... A little Jolly Thanks, Rancher. Jolly Thanks, Rancher. Jolly Rancher. That's how they got their name. And I haven't done it again since. <laughs> it worked great, but I haven't done it again. Pet stories like stories of your pets? Yeah. Okay. She was asking because it comes up every once in a while. Why do you guys hate <laughs> pets so much? So I was telling her some of our pet experiences, which are none of them really end well. No. From they, when no, we were not children. For the pets. No. <laughs> from when we were children to now. Right. What you got, Sarah? I got it. My, I, my, I haven't. I'm injured. What that happens? Hurts. It's tough to say, right? Specifically, <laughs> <laughs> years of uh, a couple of years of three of uh, carrying a really heavy kid, I guess, probably in, incorrectly, and then tried to move a full like a this really old sleeper sofa mm. by myself. I did move it. I moved it into my car. Not that it wasn't offered help, but that's something that's been going on the last two weeks, like accepting help that I don't do well. So if you hear the mic move around or you're like, what is that? That's me. That's me moving it because my neck hurts and I have to kind of like... Does this count as your official update? Mm, No. Good. Surely there's something better in there. Um, I want to pull it up. I had more, but like sometimes you, I don't know. The story is going to take too long. It's just right, like, you're trying to figure not, out, like, yeah, do I start? Not worth right. It. I don't want to just dig myself into a hole. <laughs> well, tell me while she's looking it up. Well, here. well, that same that same night, I was telling her pet stories, and mostly from when we were kids. Those, and, are, those are the winners. Yeah, those are the winners. And then she went into some. I don't know. She started getting. They just get emotional at bedtime. It's like all of the yes. problems yeah. of the day all of a sudden arise at bedtime, and they must be dealt with immediately. And so. She was saying something like maybe that she had had a hard day at school, but started going off on this whole tangent of you guys just don't understand me and you don't understand my feelings. She started going into this zone where I don't really know how serious to take it because she is getting worked up. Yeah. yeah, she's getting worked up. Her emotions are getting stronger. And I'm like, okay, is this a moment where she's like really needing to talk to me and be vulnerable? Or is she trolling me because she's trying to have a longer, right, bed, right, right. A longer bedtime? <laughs> and I'm always just trying to figure it out while she's talking. And so she's starting to be like, I just, yeah, I mean, sometimes you guys just don't understand me and my feelings. And like, if I could just like, like when I get upset, like to deal with my feelings, if I could just like go into my room, like by myself. And there was just like a cat sitting on the bed. <laughs> 
And then every, like, I could just, like, talk to the cat. <laughs> I was like, you piece of trash. This is all still about oh, getting God. a pet. Aha. <laughs> uh-huh. And as soon as the word cat left her mouth, I started laughing so hard. <laughs> and then she she couldn't hold on to it anymore. Then she started laughing. Like, you are such a little rat. And actress. She is mm-hmm. an actress. Wow. I have learned that Ava and I are actually emotionally the same exact person and the same exact age. Like like when she talks about her feelings or when she, I'm just like, yeah, yeah, I know. I know. There's no, I have no felt sense of being the adult or the parent. I'm just like, (laughs) right. Yeah. I get in that place with kids too. I don't know what that, are you, does that speak to your, to your trauma or do you like, just your personality. I have, I have no idea. Are just She's in touch with that age. No. She's the no. oldest. I yeah. The first. Right. She just. Mm. She just. I, I feel like I'm with a version of myself mm. when I'm with her. Mm-hmm. Specifically, her, mm-hmm. not all right. kids. Right. Yeah. Sarah, how's your week? Um. Well, forget my notes. I. I. Th- last time I believe was the time that I was bragging about anxiety management. Is that yeah. right? I said, don't jinx it. Okay. He was doing well with the new school, finally. Yeah. yeah. He's doing great. I mean, there have been set, like a couple of morning, but that's just going to happen. But my, my anxiety is not great. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember if we... I hate when I do that. I don't remember if... um. You were talking about caffeine. You were saying you stopped drinking coffee before yeah, you take it. I still them. have done that, but... That was just a band-aid to the real anxiety. I guess. <laughs> I'm like, oh, there's a whole other layer. It's even deeper and more real. Right. <laughs> the coffee just like, bought you a yeah, couple weeks yeah, of being yeah. like, maybe this mm. that was all I needed wow, to change. It really lowered my baseline. It feels great, but there's it's still there. So um okay, here's what I thought about before. My aunt and uncle came to visit, and my aunt this is an aunt that I haven't gotten to spend a ton of time with in my adulthood, but she spent a lot of time with me when I was in high school and I was like, just the worst possible scenarios for what, what your teenage daughter is or is like, <laughs> all of those things. And she, like when I was grounded, I couldn't do you know anything. And I lived in the middle of the woods and she would come and pick me up and take me to movies and spend time. And she was cool and funny. And so that's a long sidebar. But she was here this weekend and I was thinking about, I just felt really safe when they left and I I didn't even know that I would feel like that. And I feel like this is maybe none of it's usable, but safe people in your kid's life are, I, I just hope that he has people like that. I think that you're like that. And I hope that you're like that. (laughs) And, um, it, it, that just carries you through and it's just a big deal. So I don't know. Don't leave this. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely leaving it. Anyway. Uh, do you feel like it made you feel like someone was around that made you feel the way that you want to make Parker feel, but you feel like you've been hard on yourself about not being that person for him as much as you want to because of your anxiety. So it felt like you were kind of getting something that you feel like you've been missing. Maybe because that is like a linear thought based on those two things that I just said, Mm -hmm. but I don't think so. I was just, it was just a departure. I was just saying since last time anxiety and maybe that's exactly it. That's not how I connected it in my head. Because I do hope that he feels safe with us, but I'm just thinking about, I guess that's what I think about a lot in terms of what we talked about on the episode with Kate. Really, the end game is for him to feel safe for me. And when, I don't know, yeah, I don't know. I don't need to pick it apart, but I guess I am picking it apart. What part makes you feel like you talking? What? makes that emotion rise to the surface? Like what's the thing? That- the thing that I'm trying not to say, it just sounds like such a big thing. I didn't feel safe a lot. When and, you were a kid? Yeah. And it's not so much like some big, crazy, crazy thing. Um, but if you had like, a cat, 
You'd have been okay. Oh, yeah. You'd had, oh, well, man. listen, Dang. we had all kinds of pets. But then that's actually, like, I would come home from camp, and then the dog would be gone. My parents, right. they, they did the best they could. They're fine people. You should tell Ava, I had the cat. It didn't work. It didn't work. I had a lot of pets. It did not work. Or you work. could tell. You go home and tell Ava. I'll tell her. Guess what? And then like, Cats don't yeah. work. Then they multiplied. We had a cat named Rambo. They didn't listen. They don't listen to a damn thing, cat. They don't care about you. Uh, it was just... And maybe, maybe what I mean is the people in my life who have helped me feel that way, that like stable, secure, grounded, like maybe they seem that way. And that the way that that feels is just so important. I don't even know if this is a mom cult thing, but well, and that feeling feels more powerful as a parent because you have this thing that's like just a piece of your soul exposed in the world that. Yeah. I don't know. You, you can understand that feeling in it, but from a different perspective, right? Because not only have you been yeah. a kid living that, but now you're an adult yeah. um, wanting to make sure that your kid gets surrounded by that too. Right. Which and is I, like, just yeah. not probably always going to be possible, which is terrifying. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I constantly, that's what I, yeah. Oh, I wish I was just better at honing in on the thing I'm trying to say. <laughs> you're great. <laughs> um, okay. So as you were saying that, I like all of a sudden had the thought, like, what would it take for you to feel safe with Parker? Do you mean like me personally? Yeah. Like myself, yeah. not him feeling no, safe. Yeah. No. That's funny. Cause I have thought about that recently. Like I'm, I'm so scared of, of screwing up that sometimes there is like an, a lack of safety, like with him. It's, I don't even know how to describe mm-hmm. that. That's something I need to like dig into. But I think that that's what I'm building towards. Mm-hmm. All of those overthinks and and then like pullbacks and all of that stuff. Oh my I, goodness! I think I'm building towards that feeling. Like yeah, yeah. I had a walk with Penny a couple of weeks ago. I was like, I have to talk about this on the podcast. It was just an hour walk, and it was just me, her, and my water bottle. Like there was nothing else. No diaper bag. Nothing. No, nothing. <laughs> we had water, and um, I realized that. And I'm, I know this happened with me, but I was so aware of how safe she felt with me, mm. like completely safe to explore, to lead me. Like it was an, like, I've never had that experience with a child that age in particular. And I realized there was something that was happening because I was not paying attention to her. I was paying attention to everything. And I realized because of what I study and do, like that she knew I was paying attention to everything. So she was free to explore Mm. and be the kid and be the one, like she knew she could get my attention whenever she needed it. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't trying to get, you know what I'm saying? Like there was just this complete, like I can do whatever. And I thought, okay, when I'm a distracted parent, or it's a lot easier to not be a distracted aunt or grandparent or whatever. Mm-hmm. But when I am a distracted parent, you're, I, I just realized all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we think the kids want us to pay attention to them. That's not what they're asking for. They're saying, I need you to be paying attention so I can be a kid and not worry. I don't know how to tell if we're safe. I don't know how to tell if you're really here or not. And so I've got to, they're keeping us engaged, but we think that they want our attention. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's what parenting has turned into. I'm distracted. And then I'm a hundred percent focused on you to compensate because I know I've been distracted. And then I'm distracted again. And then back. And what kid wants, have you ever met a kid who wants a hundred percent of their parents' attention? (laughs) Mm -mm. Right? I definitely don't. No. So I, this is like totally blown my mind. Like, I feel like this is a, kids don't want your attention. They just want you to be paying attention. And that feels revolutionary to me. The whole, and, and watching what happened to her in that time. And I wasn't, I was doing my own thing, but she knew, you know, Jenny's going to know if we're not supposed to go that way or whatever. So anyway, I'm obsessed with this thought. And also that. How many kids are suffering under their parents paying too much attention to them? Like, can you stop? Can you stop? Mm -hmm, You know? mm -hmm. So it's like kind of all or nothing. It's kind of what we've turned into. Yeah. Well, that's all I got. I have a big update. (laughs) 
We have a really big update. Please. Have you done your update? That was, I think, okay. I think she's, I think she's, she's she's done. my quota. Yeah, I think she's done. (laughs) Well, my really big update is after (laughs) almost two years, our book is up on Amazon. (gasps) Ooh. So uh, it's on Amazon.com. It's called Our Digital Soul by Jenny Black and Bob Hutchins. And it was so much work. Mm -hmm. It was so much work. And I feel like we sat down to kind of talk about what our, like now what? And like, now we have all the work to do. It was, it's just, it's like birthing, like I, nine months, I grew a baby. We did it. We did it. Um, No, no, (laughs) not even close. (laughs) So anyway, that was a huge. Did you get to enjoy the feeling of it being done or not? not. No, it's, it's all been a bizarro. In fact, I went to work out after that. I had this a crazy morning, which I'll talk about later. Um, I went to a school where I did media trauma work with fourth to twelfth graders. Wow! Then I went from there to go finish the book, press launch. And then I went there from there to work out, and the guy who was working out with me was like, "So, what you been up to today?" <laughs> I was like, and um, then I like, it's not even three o'clock. <laughs> it's been a very I cannot big believe day. what's happened today. So yeah. That's very, very that exciting? exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. And now we're on a podcast tour. So now we're just finding podcasts to go on. And I was like, hey, Bob, I'm going to be on my sister's podcast. I'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone listens to it. It's going to be a game changer. This is my dream. My real dream. To, I have two dreams for it. The first one is I want every therapist to have it. Like I think if therapists had it, what could be done with it right. will get That's to happen the quickest, with quickest avenue people. To spread it around. But then the second one is I really hope that it could be used as a textbook for like a semester course in a high school or college or both. Those are my dreams. You said it. Yeah. I spoke it out. Spoke it. Your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> That's called secreting. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. Did you read that book? No. But Me now either. I want to. Me either. It's probably stupid. Is it no. stupid? No, I mean, I don't know. Um, I like the term makes me really happy, so I want to read it. Yeah, it's, I think it's just manifesting, mm-hmm. believing mm-hmm. already. Aff- affirmations. I like secreting so much better than manifesting. Yeah. Secreting yeah. sounds way more fun. It does. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like this little wink that's like kind of, I know you did that for me, mm-hmm. as opposed to manifesting, feeling like this sort of, I must. I, I don't deserve. know. Right, right, right. Some sort of. Yeah. Hippie thing. Stupid. No, I mean, I'm a big fan of manifesting. I'm not minimizing the idea of manifesting's manifesting. Manifesting's garbage. <laughs> Sarah, what are you going to do to if us? If you're here to manifest on this podcast, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there, I mean, there was, there's so much to talk about in this episode, but y'all really need to talk because I could just start talking and talk and talk. Well, especially because she's more on your end of the, right. of the spectrum, yeah. so I'm sure... There was more. Some really, really, like, I was like, oh my gosh, those topics are so important. I'm glad they came up. No, you go for it. Yeah, jump right in. Um, Well, do you all know about the circle of security? Nope. Mm -hmm. But I think Sarah would really... I would like to know that. (laughs) That sounds... Are you you ready? (laughs) Come on, come in, come on. (laughs) So yeah, it's topical because y'all were talking about it, but also you were talking about just... In therapy, there's a big thing called attunement, which is that your client is going to have the same level of anxiety or fear or whatever that you have in the room. So like so much work you're supposed to do, a lot of work on your own basic state and energy because that's the highest level that your client is going to be able to get to. And that's, you know, that's the therapist and the client. That's a good relationship, but it's, it's not a mom and a child, right? So ulti- like that's what we do as humans. We just attune with the people that we're with, regardless of how significant our attachment is to them. So I just really lo- I loved that you talking about like, well, if I don't want my kid's anxiety to be, which is sounds so obvious. It's not obvious, right? Because when you're feeling anxious, when your kid's feeling anxious, you're feeling anxious about your kid's anxiousness you don't know that's separate than your anxiousness. Like that's really hard to pull apart. And so few parents are like, wait a second, what if I just worked on my anxiety? That kid could have 
anxiety or not have anxiety, mm-hmm. but a couple different metaphors. Kate said one that made me think of this, or maybe one of you did, but the other two metaphors that have served me well over the years is like when you are a dancer and you do, you spin around, like you've got to keep your eye on a dot on the wall right. so you don't lose your balance. And thinking about like, as the parent, you're the dot on the wall that doesn't move, which is not really realistic, but... <laughs> These are all, you know, vague things that in the yeah, moment yeah. you can be like, be Take the dot, be the with dot, with be the dot. <laughs> and then the other one was let your kid go on the roller coaster ride by themselves, but be there when they get on and when they get off of it. Mm-hmm. Just don't get on the ride with them. That has just helped me a lot. And that they can help me with any friends. Yeah. It can actually help me with myself. Yeah. <laughs> Watch Jenny go on the roller coaster. Here she goes. Stay on the platform, Jenny. <laughs> Stay on the platform. <laughs> No, I think about that. Like even just today, it, Penny was, I think I just needed to go change her diaper and she just did not want to go do that. And so she's just like kicking and screaming. And I was just like, we're going to change your diaper now. Like just see, tried to seem completely unfazed, Unaffected. which I can only do sometimes. Right. It just depends right. on if I'm at the end of my rope already or not. And that's just... You know, I feel like when you have little kids and they're just able to have tantrums whenever they want, there's always that part of us that just like, well, I want to be able to have a tantrum whenever I want right, to. So right. I and, guess I'm just going to have it right now sure. with you. <laughs> exactly. And the other part of that is I I remember coming to that moment of realizing my kids need to know that their behavior and choices does impact me. And because their behaviors and choices impact everyone who they're going to be with, like to give them that false sense that... right. I can be anything. And look, it doesn't bother you. You're always fine is not true, right? That's not going to play out in the real world, right? People are going to slap you mm-hmm. <laughs> or they'll want to, <laughs> or they don't want to play with you anymore. Um, uh, I don't think I had started it yet. When I, when we were talking to Kate, I did this course. I'm sure you'd be very impressed with it, Jenny. It's called, <laughs> I'm impressed with you for doing a course. No, it's like, six hours of videos from yep, these I'm in. Um, two. Oh, it's at a, a, the child development. It's big little feelings on Instagram. I've done their potty learning course. It was great. I think I've talked about it on here before, but in terms of what you were just saying, one of the things is um, babies are illogical. So using logic with them or trying to reason with right. them is illogical in itself. And one of the things recently that I've done is when I'm getting too irritated with him, and just by the way, I'd already shown my ass, as my dad would say, <laughs> like just was not handling it great right. already. But I was like, all oh, right, <laughs> I'm getting too upset. So I'm going to step away now so I don't yell. And I just walked to the door and turned around like, if anybody's seen Wet Hot American Summer, where they like run <laughs> and show them standing against the wall with their nose to the wall. <laughs> I didn't think about that in the moment. That would have been more fun. Um, but I just breathed. And when I came back, he said, you okay? <laughs> so, so sweet. That's been, it's been a long time since what you said. I think that was relevant. <laughs> it is. But okay. So the circle of security is basically that whole idea of attachment. It's yep. what describes attachment. So you have this primary attachment figure, which each of us are for our kiddos. But like you were talking about, it could be anybody in that moment. Like it was me for Penny in that, you know, setting. So I always like to picture like a kid at a park. So if you're standing there at the park, you've got your kid and you're like, okay, go play, right? So what healthy attachment looks like is that the mom is encouraging them to go play. And if you got to see it play out organically without the mom's issues in the way, right? You'd see a kid who's like, are you sure? I'm not really sure if I want to go play or not. And I'm, and they're looking at us to be like, is it safe? Am I safe to go out there? And if the mom's like, yeah, you're safe. They're like, okay, it's safe. So they go out and then depending on how old they are, whatever phase they're in, they're like, mom, mom, watch me do this. Come over here and see that. Right. And they're going to say, do you see me? Are you still watching me and what I'm doing? Are you still paying attention? Again, way more vague. I think it's way more, uh, unfocused attention than we've been trained to think that it is. But anyway, so then they're like, mom, watch me. I went down the slide. Here's my new friend, whatever. Well, inevitably 
something will happen. Like there's going to be a fall. Mm -hmm. There's going to be uh, somebody took something out of my hand, uh, whatever. And they're going to fall apart. And there's going to be just that like, I'm not okay. And the only person who can make them feel better in that moment, right, is their mom. Nobody else can help if the mom is available. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then they come back to the mom to be like, what happened? What happened? And then the mom, in our case, is like, oh, it's okay. You're going to be all right. Or we need to share here. Or basically you're helping your kid organize their feelings. And then they get it together and they're like, okay, ready to go. And they go play, go back out. So that is like the most... That is parenting. Like it never stops ever. It just is a, it might be the circle might be longer. It might be, you know, one of my friends, her mom died several years ago and they didn't even have a great relationship. And she's like, but every time something good happens in my life, I just want to call my mom and tell her. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause that's, that's what we do. We circle back around. So I remember when I first learned about that, I was so mad. They didn't give you that in the hospital when they sent your kid home with you. So that's kind of what you were talking about with your, if, if you are like, you're safe or it's not even, yes, you're safe. But I think maybe the bigger message that we need to be communicating to ourselves and our kids is, and we're going to be okay. Even if everything Mm -hmm. isn't, you can, you are probably going to fall. You're probably going to get hurt. And guess what? We're going to be okay. That's our goal isn't to not get hurt on the playground, right? right? Your goal is to be as brave as you can be out there with knowing what safe limitations are. So anyway, I love, 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 love that so much. And it has helped me through. There's a whole other section that we can talk about sometime that's in relationships where you do like, that's in an intimate relationship Mm -hmm. that you do that for your partner. So it's not something you outgrow, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And the more you have that, the more you're able to be that for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like to hear more about that relationship one. I have a a picture in everything. (laughs) Fix our marriages. (laughs) Yeah. I'm your girl. (laughs) That's me. The expert. Okay. What else? What are y'all, what are some of y'all's thoughts on? Oh, no, 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 please. <laughs> no, no. This is where we get to. We already did our episode with the guests. Yeah, okay. This is, okay, our, this is, this is our chance. We build to, on your thing. Okay. Yeah, we, we just, so here, I don't know how much longer we have because my notes don't go on forever. But okay. So that's one thing I've been doing a lot with myself that you guys kind of have the advantage of it being played out in front of you is having this. I don't remember where some, y'all talked about this that made me mm-hmm. reference the idea of that. I have inside of me, I'm like an adult role, a parent role and a kid role Mm -hmm. and that I can identify. So that's kind of when I was talking earlier about how I feel with Ava, it's like, that's my inner child. She is my inner child. She is. And I like, how can I be connected with that part of myself and value that part of myself and not judge that part of myself and also not let that part of myself get in charge of my Drive life. Drive the car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh God, she's really been driving a lot lately. <laughs> um, and then the, like that parent, what you guys are developing right now, I mean, we just have to work so hard to develop that parent role in ourselves, right? Or maybe we had to develop it too early on or, you know, like mm-hmm. it's like, I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out. I've got this covered. It's not really about my needs right now. It's about your needs. Right. And that's appropriate. That's an appropriate role to be in sometimes. And y'all are in it a majority of the time. Right. That's the role. You've got little ones. You're, you're practicing finding and being in. And, and I, you know, even... I don't do it so much with my kids now. They probably would appreciate if I did. But even now, just being able to be like, okay, be the parent. Like snap out of it. Be the parent right now. Mm -hmm. That this is, um, and I really loved uh, Kate's talk or her thought of like, I'm like a Lego. I'm one Lego brick in the whole set of the Legos. Um, Of, you know, not over, 
not overstating your importance, and yet you can't understate it either. Like right. they grew inside of you. I mean, it's just the whole, you're responsible for them staying alive every day. So it's just this weird place to hold. Right. I'm not that important. Oh my God, they would die today if it weren't <laughs> for me. I kind of am important. There, how many people talk about anyone other than their mother in therapy? Right. <laughs> But anyway, then the other role is the adult role and having that choice of, okay, I do have these, these inner child feelings or what I do, like there's also a lot of relationships that being the parent is not appropriate, right? right. Or even being the parent outside of the realm with your kids where you sh- it's not time for you to be the parent, right? It's the age doesn't match mm-hmm. or the situation doesn't match, match. You're being an adult. So anyway, I just think that's a really in terms of practically emotionally getting through a day, having those check-ins of even when I am feeling the intensity of my inner child and the pull of my overcompensating parental side, remembering that there is an adult voice inside of me, like it's there. I usually don't care. <laughs> I don't I don't want to know about it. Mm-hmm. Like when I'm feeling you're like, I that just, way. I don't, I don't, I just want to have, right, I just want right, to feel right. how I want to feel. Exactly. It. Or, or usually I want the other person to feel that. <laughs> <laughs> and like finding that inner adult is just, has been a helpful tool and being like, oh, dang, she really does know. Like, wow, she can get it together or she does know what to do right now or whatever. I just didn't, I just wasn't listening. Right. Not giving her the time. So thoughts on that? I just, I mean, I just feel like that's almost every day is just juggling those three. I was just thinking about this, but in different terms, I was thinking about how the things that have that just like that you have to do the must do's. And then there's like, okay, well what, then what are my needs? And then if you can manage to get those and you're like, what do I want? (laughs) Like what, what we want is just like at the tail tail end, or if we are, if if we are trying to pay attention to what we want, then there's always the guilt involved and being like, well, am I sure that everyone else's needs are met already? And the things that I need to be a good person to give the needs to the other people. And so there's just, just days where you feel like you're not going to get through all of those things enough to the end of the day to get something that not even that you need, which is, I feel like when you're a parent is a luxury to right, get the things right, you, you need. need. Right. So getting the things you want or just even feel even further out of reach sometimes. Mom always tells a story of when she was probably in your phase of life and her younger brother, uncle Mark came to visit and they were out to lunch, which she never did ever. <laughs> and he asked her like, what do you, what do you, what are your hobbies, Christy? And she, she like, she still talks about it. It's like one of her most traumatic moments. She just sat there and she was like, what? What? Hobbies? Me? What? (laughs) Wants? Needs? (laughs) I think she cried. I think she just sat there and cried. And she also... Went to a pottery class last year. Yeah, she last did. Month. I was very excited oh, for her. Me too. She just she she's she's, she's such got, a crafty, handsy yes. person. She always yep. she needs to just be doing some physical craft at all times. It's true. Which normally is a room in my house. <laughs> right, that's really true. You are you're her craft and hobby. I, my house is her What's craft. What's my hobby? Joy. <laughs> Watch Penny cook Penny food. Decorate paint, paint something. Paint this room, rearrange this furniture. Joy, mm-hmm. have you ever been driving around and you just need 30 seconds of, I don't know, to check your phone or to just space out and have cry. your kid entertained? To cry? Yeah. Yes. You know what a great thing that you can do would be? I think I do. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to the car wash. We're going to the car wash. And the car wash that Mom Colt endorses is <laughs> Camel Express Car Wash, locally owned in Nashville, Tennessee. And Mom Colt listeners can text Mom Colt to 30400 for a free $25 car wash. Treat yourself. Ooh. 
to 30 seconds of darkness and just <laughs> deafening sound, which happens to be usually entertaining for kids or terrifying, but either way. We'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe so, you don't know if your kid's terrified. Right in. Find your Camel Express at camelexpress.com. Thanks, Camel. What, Sarah, what are your thoughts on the adult parent kid thing? I feel like I'm, well, there are just so many. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't choosing. want to take out of everyone's time. Uh, I don't know that it's useful for this, but this is what's most loud for me is, do you think that adult voice that you hear that's always there, um, is that always there? Is that your true self or is that something that you develop? I don't know if that's too heady. I, I, I think. I was thinking that when I said it, I do think it's your true self. Mm -hmm. I do think that just even the stories I hear from kids, I'm like, wow, they're, they're, it's not an adult, right? But the things that they will notice or see or do for themselves, like watching kids survive traumatic situations and you're like, oh, that's... That's, it really is there. It's a true self. It's some voice inside of yourself. That's like, this doesn't match who I should be based on what my life has been up to this point. And yet somehow I still have access to this sort of wise or centered part, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do think it's your true self. I like that language better. Yeah. Way to go, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. <laughs> has me thinking all different things now about the parent and the child and like maybe both of them are becoming adults well i'm also wondering what if you go from being a child directly to a parent <laughs> you don't right. have the time I mean, to find that adult self between those two I, phases I think of that i think becoming a parent is actually what does it mm -hmm. i mean yeah. I, I think it or let's say it's the not the easiest path <laughs> No. But it's the most efficient way to develop that in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, yeah, I would say that's, I feel like what my experience with Ava was. I was definitely searching for myself from, I would say probably as soon as I left for college until having Ava, which was, I don't know how many years that is. But part of that was because I was already married and... Jeremy was very much on the search for himself. And I was just kind of, I don't know, along for the ride. And then we were doing stuff all the time. Like our lives were so, were so full and busy. And so that just kind of, I was trying to finish school and working and then we were doing the parties and that kind of just, it's like life just kept moving, mm -hmm. but I just kind of felt like I, I don't know. I didn't really feel like I had an identity at that point in time, but I wasn't also super aware. I probably wasn't wanting to be super right, aware. Right, right. And then having Ava really just made me be like, oh gosh, I'm so, I feel so depleted now that I've got to find out who I want to be when I get my life back. When I get time back, I don't want to waste it. Like mm -hmm. what, or just I want to be doing this, but I want to be happy doing it. And right now I'm not right, happy. Right. I, and I feel like I'm... Are you talking about parenting? Yeah. Okay. I'm kind of trapped yeah, here yeah. now, but I wanted this. And I feel like that is what catapulted me into doing the work to find myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then it was like, okay, I can use the motivation to do that and take the time to do that because I know that then that will make me a happier mom and I will be happy to be here raising this kid because I will also know who well, I, who well, I the am. The whole identity thing, right? It's so easy to lose your identity in your partner. It's easy to lose your identity in becoming a mom in any role, right? Your work, whatever. And so when you... First of all, we all see how it plays out if we lose our identity and being a mom, like poor kids, right? But also if you don't have an identity, you're looking for that kid to give you like, or you're seeing everything you're missing out on. It's that identity that makes you able to kind of surrender to the mm -hmm. process. Like, oh, I know who I am and where I'm supposed to be right now, what I'm supposed to do. And that's what I was thinking. That's how I felt when I felt sort of that switch to feeling safe with my kids, which I would never have said it that way, except for our conversation today. That was it. It was like, oh, I'm supposed to be right here and I'm going to do a good job of it. 
When was that? And exactly how, how did you get there? And what did that look like? Um, the lead up. Just forget no, everything else. I feel, I feel like I talked about this, but maybe it's one of those things you can not talk about enough. You did, but my memory is terrible. Um, no, I really am so, I feel so terrible about this, but I resented them so much. I was really young. I was 23 when I had Brandon, 25 when I had both of them. And to tell you all the story of being at, like, have it, mom had a birthday. Like she said, what do you want to do for your birthday? I was like, I want to have a fire pit. My brother came. We had a fire. My two little kids. It was just me, Jerry, Brandon, and Avery, mom and dad. I think Jerry brought a girl. Where was I? College, I guess. Psh. Stupid. Not in my <laughs> Yeah, we Wasn't were like, worth it. We were like, yeah, we didn't want to invite Joy. <laughs> She's the least fun member of our family. <laughs> Brings it down every time. So, um, honestly, we have no idea how to have a good time without her. So just be clear. <laughs> just be clear on that. So we're sitting at the fire. So brother's ex- like two years and four days younger than me. I guess his girlfriend says, um, so how old are you, Jenny? And I was like, I'm 25. Like, wow, like that's a big thing, right? Fourth of decade, blah, blah, whatever, yay, sitting there. And Jerry's like, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes later, however long in Jerry's timing, he goes, hey, Jen, are you sure you're 25? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. He was like, well, that's confusing because I'm about to turn 24. Yeah, he knows. He's, right. And he doesn't ever tell me I'm wrong. He's never thought I'm wrong. Like He really has to do a lot of work to be like, I think my big sister is wrong. I think Jenny messed up. And I just remember sitting at that fire pit. It's like still so sad and just being like, we lost never, a year. I never knew that I was 24. I totally, that's, I had Avery, like when it was like, I had my two kids and I missed a whole year of my life. And that's how I felt. Like, I just felt like, how unfair. Yeah. And all of my friends were, I had no friends that also had kids. So they were all, you know, living that life. And I just, and also my husband was living that life too, because he was teaching high right. school. So he was gone. He was on trips. So I just, it was like just me and the kids at home. And I just resented them so much, mm-hmm. resented how hard it was. I was so lonely. I was just angry, just mm-hmm. really, really angry. And I kept trying to call it like, it's postpartum depression. It's postpartum right. depression. Right. Like, oh, she's just pissed. <laughs> and um, I don't even know. I, I mean, other than it being some sort of miracle or like big reveal was, do you want to do this well or mm-hmm. not? Right. Like, and it wasn't even about the kids. I don't, I'm, I, that's what would have, what did motivate me later on. But it was this like, let go. Mm-hmm. Pretend this is the only thing in the world and do this as best as you can possibly do it. And you're going to fall Survive. in love with it. Or like you're going to, yeah. as long when you let your heart be right. there and be like, I want this to be awesome. Yeah. And it, but I had to let go. And this is what probably one of the things that makes me so compassionate about moms on social media. I never, I went through that without ever seeing what anyone else was doing any day. Right. And it was still that brutal for right. me. Right. So I was able to just create my own little world with them. And it was, I mean, today and them talking about it, like those were the most magical. I would I didn't do any, you know, that was, mm-hmm. there was nowhere else to be. I'd go there any day. If I had a day added to my life, I'd go back to that time. Right. Yeah, I was thinking the other day about how much your kids take from you (laughs) and just the uh, immeasurable things that they give, that they bring to your life. Like just like how the the massiveness of those two categories is just so overwhelming. I mean, truly at this, at this time in my life, there's no comparison. Like as much as I thought I gave them everything, I thought I, I've gave them, you know, 20 plus years of everything I had. And I can't even explain how much they give to me. Like I can't, it, it's like, it's not even a fair. Mm-hmm. They give me so much. It's like, it was like, you thought that was a lot. Like, right. It's like paying everything you could to buy a few stocks in Apple. 
Like it's all you had. Right. And you're like, I'm giving everything. You're welcome. Right. <laughs> it's, it's just an investment like nothing you could imagine. Right. Nothing you could imagine. That's sort of, I mean, Kate didn't say it as beautifully. I mean, she said it. She said it. <laughs> Sorry, she said Kate. It, no, She's a little she more crass funny. in her yeah. delivery. Of she things. said it funny. <laughs> but that reminds me of what she said. It's just another version of it, I feel. Like, or at least I know that that's how she feels, you know? Right. There's this really sacred space between giving your kids everything you have to give them and finding your identity and being their mom. Mm-hmm. That's like, that's, it's not the same thing. And so that space is where you are who you are and you're there because you know, I'm important to this person. I'm going to do this well. That's, different than finding your identity. Like it it gives a different energy into your kids, I guess, because I do know a lot of kids that feel very burdened in their adult life because of how much their parents need them to stabilize themselves. Right. Right. Not in a relationship, but like, I need you to be this way and show up here and do these things because, you know, anyway. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. I have two more things. Perfect. That's perfect. Um, first of all, have I ever sung to you guys my favorite song of Avery's that she just sang around the house when she was four? Maybe. She sang all her songs. I mean, when maybe she was to four. me. And I doubt. I just think this is like everyone needs this in their heads every day. Every every day begins with a dream and every day has a problem. <laughs> It's so true. <laughs> Wait, that's the whole song. That's the whole song. I mean, she had more, but that's the part we all remember. And like, this is so life changing when you when you finally acknowledge every day has a problem. Like, you can just stop being angry or right. surprised. Just, just it's, know when it shows up. You're like, there you there are. You are. Like, I've been looking for you, you all day. <laughs> we need more power steering fluid already. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon's gonna laugh really hard at that, dude. That's, right, because I have that effing car. God, Joy has Brandon's old car. I mean, I can't. Oh my gosh! So anyway, it's I just that came to my thing. mind at some point that I was like, I feel like this is a life motto that would change <laughs> everything for all of us if we could accept it. Ava's for a chunk of time, she would just walk around and go. <laughs> The drama, the madness, the pity. (laughs) Which I think could still work. It does. It does. (laughs) Put those two together. Okay, a really big conversation that probably deserves a whole podcast. Okay, so I told you I was going to go back. I went to that school last week, talked to, I had a group of fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, 50 of them for 90 minutes. And then I had a group of sixth through 12th graders for 90 minutes and did media trauma conversation. And it feels very much like if if you could imagine the first people that ever went to a school to talk about why smoking was bad for you Mm -hmm. and to give the actual information, you know, the education about it, that's kind of how we're going. But of course you can't say why media is bad for you. Right. It's just crazy to me. This, this conversation, every time I have this conversation with a group of students in particular, there's no one who's ever had this conversation with them before, and it's all their life is about. Right. They're like, we're going to talk about math one hour every single day. Okay. Like, like mm-hmm. there's almost nothing else that matters in their world right, right. now, and nobody's talking about it. So, claw. Anyway, this hour and a half of the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders was the best. Like, I mean, I just want to shout from the rooftops, like, this is the hope of, and future, like, Ray of hope as their hands were up the whole time. I had 50 kids attention for 90 minutes. They did not stop like engaging. Mm-hmm. So, and, and what they tell me, I mean, it, it just, it melts me and it's brilliant and it's why, I mean, it's just so precious. So anyway, um, one girl, right. So we're talking about all these different forms of technology, how they help you and what's ethical technology versus predatorial technology. And I kind of take some hard stands on different things. But one little girl said, well, what do you think of my, um, my 
my dad and his girlfriend, they have an app on their phone that has a camera to my baby sister's room. And they check it all the time to see my baby sister. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but like, what do you think of that? And I was like, oh, this is a good conversation. Like, obviously nothing's wrong with that, right? It's a baby monitor. It's, um, we had a conversation about how could that help the baby and the parent, right? So it helps the baby because you don't wake up the baby to go check on it. Mm -hmm. It helps the parent because the parent gets to, gets more rest. And it's like, okay, I don't have to go check on whatever. So great, nice convenience, whatever. And, um, then I said, but let's talk for a second about what doesn't happen when you can always see your baby through your phone. And so I acted out this, like with one of the little girls, like I acted out, okay, is she okay? Like walking, you know, tiptoeing down the hallway and going in and like peeking at her and like patting her little head and maybe giving a kiss and walking back. And I was like, what, what do we miss out on if that's all we ever did? Right. And the kid said a relationship. (laughs) (laughs) It's just like. Wow. Right. I had thought about this in terms of how we function with social media, that there's something in our brains, the way that our brains take it, takes in information. We think if we know what our friends are doing and they know what we are doing, that we are friends Mm -hmm. because I have data about your life in my mind that doesn't make a relationship. But unfortunately it tells us we have a relationship, Mm -hmm. but our bodies and our hearts know that we don't have that. So like sort of a lot of the explanation of so much loneliness, it may be that we're lonely, but it's actually so puzzling because consciously we know we shouldn't be. We have all these friends and we're connected to them in a way that we haven't been before, right? Mm -hmm. I would imagine if I had social media when my kids were younger, I would have felt less lonely seeing what, you know, there's other consequences, but I would have felt more connected to people, right? So then this gets in the conversation of surveillance parenting, because what's happened, which is what Kate was talking about when y'all were referencing, is that we've taken that moment of a baby monitor, because I don't want to get out of bed and wake the baby, to I have friends who have kids who are in middle school now who still have a camera in their room, and that's how their parent checks on them or sees if they're staying in bed or whatever. So I can 100% say at that point, it's only a loss of relationship. That you getting your kid in bed, checking your kid, but your kid coming out, all of all of those things we do with our bodies and our minds and our brains and our that's the relationship. That's what's mm-hmm. making the relationship. So just checking on them to make sure they're doing what you're saying. But also then the kids were like, I think that is so creepy. I do not want a camera. Like they were talking about when they wanted the camera out of their room, mm-hmm. right? So we never dealt with that. Right. Like I just don't. I just want to go to my room and pet my cat. <laughs> cat I, I need to know I am not being watched at all times. Yeah. And that's, that is creating a whole other sort of psychological issue. But fascinating, find my iPhone is a huge problem with parents. Mm-hmm. Huge. And we were talking about couples too, but I'm just sticking to parents yeah. today. Um, Adam, my <laughs> first <laughs> husband, <laughs> my kid's dad... <laughs> My kid's dad. That's good. That's a good one. Um, He had a significant issue with find my iPhone. And like he had to delete it. He had to disconnect it from his phone. And checking it? mm -hmm. Okay. I get compulsive checking. But here's what, this is the conversation I ended up having with the parents who were a part of that. The parents and the teachers who were a part of it. Is that the problem with surveillance parenting, besides all the things that you just know off the top of your head, is that... When you set up a situation where your phone or you you have any access, which Kate talked about, control, right? That at any moment I can check to make sure my kid's safe, right? I can see in their classroom. I can check to see their cars parked here or whatever. They got to that friend's house. That reassurance that you get, that a parent gets that their child is safe is one of the most dysfunctional habits a parent could develop 
is that I need to know my kids safe all the time. And I have access to that because the parent never has to develop the resilience mm. and the, the, um, internal stability to know I'm okay, whether I know my kids okay right now or not. Mm -hmm. And the more that we develop this habit of, I could check if I'm not, I'm scared, nervous, anxious, I can check my phone. And I've regulated that. We actually create an obsessive compulsive disorder. Like you're actually making it happen. Mm -hmm. And it changes your relationship with your kid to be one that's just managing your anxiety all the time. Right. And you, because you have access to that information, what it does to your experience is every single second I'm thinking my kid could have just died right now. And parents from past generations had to get through that. They had to let go of that. I don't know. How could I know? So it's created this thing that makes you feel like you're a good parent if you know your kid's safe. And like what the student said, but you're not actually having a relationship with your kid. You're just making sure they're still alive. Right. So there's one other part of that that was really important. Oh, so I was interviewing someone on a podcast and she asked me, I said, you know, number one reason every single parent says I have to have the phone on me at all times is why? Kids. Why? Not just kids. In case of an emergency. Mm. My kids have got, whoever has my kids, whatever, right? So Mel, who I was interviewing said, hey, Jen, how many times in your 20 four years of parenting, did you get a call that your kids needed you for an emergency? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Zero. But we live every day. We create an entire lifestyle around the possible emergency that could happen with my kid, which puts us in the fight or flight state. Well, it just makes us walking paramedics. Right. Exactly. Really, exactly. <laughs> that we haven't been trained for. <laughs> right. Right. So anyway, I think that's a big conversation. It was such a big deal to the adults that were in that conversation that they want me to go back and do an entire workshop because they were saying it's that managing parents' anxiety right now is is their biggest job. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, well, and it's kind of also what we were, as far as we were talking about with your kids, it's, it's putting them in a position where your kids are also managing your anxiety, right. which they're they reassuring to be carrying exactly. that. Exactly. Well, yeah, actually. Yeah. I've heard that recently from, um, uh, an 18 year old that will remain nameless, like an obsession with the find my, my iPhone mm -hmm. and they just went to college and the relief of that being out from under that has been a really big deal. And like, massive development moment. So I get that. So owning that I'm uh, potentially like growing towards part of the problem that you're talking about and like owning that that could be me. Um, also, do, or with that aside, do you see the merit in these tools? Like the possibility that, um, because you're really lucky that you didn't have someone call you and have sure, an emergency, sure. you know? Yeah. I do think it's, it's an interesting to then like go through parents who did have emergencies and how rarely you get the direct call. Mm -hmm. There's still, you're, you're going to find out you're mm -hmm. go, you know, it, it's not like if an emergency happens, you're not going to know. So just also that bizarreness that we think if I don't have a phone in my hand at all times, then like that five uh, minutes is right, going to be the, right, the make or break right, moment. Right. Or that I'm the one who could save them. In, moment, yeah. So I think there's, there's some myths about that, that it just gives us security. It's not actually really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I really, I, I guess at this point in time, because the other thing I see is in case they ever need you. And I don't think that's developing really healthy skills either. Like I have friends who can't go anywhere, like who like they get calls of like, wait, mom, how do I do the whatever? And their kids like live all over and they can't get through one day without calling their mom for whatever. I just don't think that's like, it's the opposite side of not having a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's that I'm, I'm not going out far enough and exploring and coming back mm -hmm. the older that we get, because I can, my mom's just always going to answer when I call, mm -hmm. which I do always answer when my kids call. I just don't always have my phone with me mm -hmm. when they call. Um, and I, I mean, I'd be so curious to have my kids' perspective on it, but they know I'm there for them. There's no question, is my mom there for me? I think it would be interesting to, because Adam 
is he's the one who's going to answer and he's going to get in the car and go real fast and he's going to be their emergency service. So I think they're kind of lucky that they have both of those things, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of accessibility. And mm-hmm. my concern is more, is the tool undoing more than the tool can help you do? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's 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 a mixed bag, which is the problem. Mm-hmm. Right now, I think particularly unless parents get some education and practices around that. I definitely think it's feeding into the anxiety of the culture. For totally. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good luck, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> got a lot on your plate. Sure you need to go. You've got a phone, <laughs> you're screwed. <laughs> um, yeah. Just looking to your phone to manage your anxiety and looking to your kids to manage your anxiety just won't work. Mm-hmm. That's all. It won't work. Well, you got your Jenny's favorite thing I this do. week before we leave. I do. I'm so excited about it. Okay, my favorite thing is a person. <gasps> Ooh, her is name it is, me? <laughs> her name is Kathy Souder. Dang it. K-A-T-H-Y-S-A-U-D-E-R. And you can find her at kathysouder.com. And right now you're wondering, why? Why do I want to find her? Why do we want you're to You're about to find <laughs> out. Kathy Souder is my money coach. Oh, that's I, um, she works for a company called Money Grit and you, she could be your men, money coach also, but she also can connect you to money coaches. There's like lots of money coaches. She's just where to start. Anyway, I have struggled with issues with money, both emotional issues as well as practical issues. I really have like number dyslexia. Like I, all of it is so overwhelming. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's so much. And then Same. there's a lot of shame and blah, 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 so many feelings. But anyway, so she coaches you through both of those things. Like I now know every single month I have a plan for what that month is going to be. And she talks a lot about creating your plan instead of reacting to what happened last month. And so I create a plan for the month. I know exactly how much I'm going to need. Even things like there's no such things as emergencies anymore, which I didn't even know that could happen. One of her famous quotes is, back to our conversation about wants and needs is that when you take care of your needs, you can take care of your wants. When you take care of your wants, you can never take care of your needs. Like if you take care of your wants first, you can't ever Mm -hmm. get to your needs, which means you won't ever be okay. When you take care of your needs, you're really okay. Even if you can't get to your wants, right? Like wants are truly like, Oh, that would be fun to have. Like one of the things I want right now is speakers for every room in my house. Mm -hmm. That's a want. I don't need that. I'm fine, but I do need, um, food. I I need food. Like I mean, like there there are these things that's like, (laughs) but there are these points where now I, but I will tell you, that's just a you problem. (laughs) Here's, here's why it's a me problem because I am so want to remain in so much denial about how much food costs, which I think Mm -hmm. everybody wants to be in denial Mm -hmm. about that. Definitely. So it's very frustrating that I am as organized as I am with my money and that if I didn't know, no, I need this amount. If I wasn't paying attention to that, I'd be like, well, I might as well get the speakers. I mean, all the money spent at the end of the month anyway, at least I'd get speakers out of it and I wouldn't have food. Right. <laughs> so it's not as much of a joke as you think that it is. Like it's easy to, to spend out my basic necessities. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, I don't, I don't know how much she charges per session. I know how much she charges me, but I was like one of her first students. So I got this rate mm-hmm. while she was getting her mm-hmm. certification. Mm-hmm. That's great. Good news. <laughs> right. Well, but also there's other people. Like if you want to do that too, there's tons of people always being certified yeah. that could pay that. And that's $50 a session. Cool. And never spent better money in my whole life. It, it has it has actually multiplied my money. She said she can't explain to people, like once they start money coaching, money just starts coming in. She told me that at the beginning and she's like, I can't make you any promises, but I'm telling you, it's happened to everyone. I mean, I've had random things come in the mail that I'm just like, where is this money coming from? So anyway, I it is the most <laughs> life-changing Sold. thing. I It is life-changing. <laughs> You don't even, you want to know how much my first check was that randomly showed up in the mail? Sure. $23,000. Jesus. <laughs> it was a, that. it was a tax. And you don't even know what it was. It from? was a tax refund. <laughs> We'd never gotten a tax refund before. It was some 
like thing we overestimated or mm-hmm. some back here that didn't get whatever it would have happened whether I had done it was right, just really right, funny right. <laughs> it started I believe in Kathy <laughs> but are you crediting her with your tax refund um <laughs> I'm crediting her with it. with it not disappearing as soon as it got there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because when mm-hmm. money does come in, you're like, wait, I didn't plan on this. Mm-hmm. Just the same way you don't plan on when it goes out. Right. Mm-hmm. And now you do plan on it going out, but you don't plan on it randomly coming in. And so when it comes in, it becomes this real thing that gets to show up in your life. Mm. I like that. So anyway, Kathy Souter is my favorite thing today. Hey, Kathy. I like it. I'm going to call that Kathy. <laughs> okay. Well, you want me to say something? Ooh. I've talked too much. I think someone else needs to talk. Oh, man. It's been really peaceful for me, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to sit back and, and listen, which was nice. Felt good. Everybody, glad you're here. Mm-hmm. Thanks for Hope tuning you in. you feel safe. <laughs> <laughs> and your Delete. trust tree within the nest. <laughs> <laughs> Delete your uh, find my phone. And, <laughs> yeah. um... Burn your... <laughs> Burn your yeah, burn your phone. Buy some Jolly Rancher. There we go. Some uh, Jolly Ranchers are the king. <laughs> Keep them up high. And we'll talk to you next time. Yeah. Mwah. Bye. Love Bye. you guys. Bye. Ooh. Bye. Is that harmonizing? Bye. 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 No, I can't really do it. Thank you. <laughs>